Beloved, it is throughout the long season of Pentecost that the liturgy brings to our consideration the full implication of the life and witness of the Catholic Church. The Gospel readings throughout this long series of Sundays present, in almost every case, moral teachings of the Lord, which express in one way or another the call to conversion of life, and the generosity that we must show as Christians to others. These readings are supported by their accompanying epistles taken almost entirely from St. Paul and St. Peter. Recall, for example, last week, uh, Paul bore witness to the historical truth of the resurrection of Christ and Paul's formation of what we believe is the earliest scriptural foundation for the Apostles' Creed. In this way, through the liturgy, we find the spiritual wealth of what this holy season, now simply known as ordinary time, has to offer. The Church, <clears throat> in her solemn worship, places before us, and within the ever-present and all-pervasive first mystery of faith, which is the Holy Trinity, it then considers Christ incarnate, crucified and resurrected, and then Him as revealing revealing all that is necessary for our salvation. To the vast company of the human race, he gives as eyewitnesses, and then empowered as leaders and teachers, his apostles, whose lives, teachings, whose martyrdoms laid the foundation for the church's work and her ministry even unto the ends of the world. And so, unceasingly, the Church must continue to proclaim the one unchanging Christian truth, and that is aversion from sin and conversion to God, love of neighbor for the love of God, and that until Christ returns to judge the living and the dead. Now this witness reaches a sort of pinnacle in today's Mass and liturgical texts. What is the inner power of Christ's own work? Why do miracles drive us to the spreading abroad of his name and his glory? What drove the apostles to the end that they would almost all suffer and die? For the cause of the Lord. And why does the Church, in her authentic wisdom, never cease to carry out her divine work? Well, the answer to the worldly and to the Jews who expected a political savior, the answer is a great letdown. Many prophets and kings have desired to see the things you have seen and hear the things that you have heard. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. The poignant and paradoxical conclusion of today's gospel is in fact the summit of messianic teaching. Who is neighbor to the man who has suffered misfortune. The lawyer, forced by the evidence, gives answer to the Redeemer's question, not the priest who faithlessly walked by the suffering uh, victim of violence, not the Levite, another form of religionist of that day, the Samaritan, that was a heretic, the Samaritan. And so the lawyer, forced by the circumstances of the question, he answered Jesus' question, who was the good neighbor? The one who is the good neighbor is that man who shows mercy. Mercy. Not as God shows mercy, because we are not God, but in it that God does show mercy, we must, like God, show mercy. In this we see 
that it is love itself which is the foundation of our Christian faith and the deepest truth of God's revelation, not a sappy, saccharine, lifeless sort of good feeling, that kind of love, but sacrificial, self-denying, self-dying love. We must not let the present pseudo-gospel of social action, which has taken the world absolutely by storm, turn it upside down and render that which is sane crazy and that which is crazy the new sane. No, we must not let that pseudo-gospel cause us to ever minimize the central importance of true love in the practice of our religion. The love we bear for God both requires and impels us to a similar love towards others. Today's Gospel reminds us not only what our charity should be towards our neighbor, whether he be friend or foe, but more especially of that striking and wondrous divine love which God has already shown us in the healing of our sin, if we would but turn to him. It is not automatically given. God's mercy is engaged by us by a willing aversion, that means turning away from sin and conversion to God. And the church, which is the abiding sacrament of God's love for all mankind, one of the great meanings of sacrament is pledge. The sacrament of the altar is a pledge of future glory. The Church, the abiding sacrament of God's love for all mankind, continues this same ministry of love even unto the end of time. What is more, it is also a ministry of glory, because she, like her Master, not only teaches, but by the internal power of grace and sacraments, the Church is able to perform the miracle of our forgiveness while spreading always further and further the divine life of God among all mankind. Beloved in Christ, it is for this reason that we listen attentively with docility, with openness and humility, not only to Jesus the Lord, but to his disciples. Today, St. Paul reminds us that the letter kills, but the spirit quickens, the spirit enlivens. To be truly Christian, to be, in fact, a real and authentic believing Catholic, means being called to a genuine and divine charity, one that is Christ-centered and, for that reason, Christ-like. And so, even in these terrible times, when our neighbors may give us very great cause on the natural level for irritation or feelings far, far less edifying, let us imitate our God by a generous self-giving. Let us forgive our enemies, first of all, by praying for their conversions. And let us give of ourselves more fully, knowing that by doing as Christ did, we are fulfilling the most fundamental precept of the New Covenant. Our eyes, beloved, have seen, and our eyes have heard. Many in the Old Testament would have wished to have been recipients of what we have by way of old and familiar habit. That is why so-called Catholics can be so utterly indifferent to the content of religion, because they've grown bored with what the Church proposes to them by faith, the Church whose apostles and witnesses have seen and have heard from the lips and life and works of the Lord Jesus. We, through them, have seen, and our eyes 
have and our ears have heard. Therefore, we should keep awake by faith the liveliness of the implication of our divine and divinely revealed religion. So, let us pray yet again to Christ and his mother that throughout a lifetime of devoted service to the gospel, we might, by fidelity, which is rooted in humility, come at length to see and to hear the wonders of heaven for ourselves. There, where love reigns in unveiled majesty, even unto the ages of ages. Please rise.